We're going to be beginning in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 24. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 24. And we're going to uh, attempt to make it all the way through chapter 16 this evening. They're short chapters, so uh, we should be able to make it through. But uh, here uh, in these we have uh, prophecies concerning three different nations. Uh, in chapter 14, 24 through 27... Uh, last week, if you remember, we went through a uh, the uh, what is called the burden of Babylon, a uh, prophecy concerning the fall of Babylon and those things. And uh, in the finishing part of that, we didn't uh, go through it, but there's actually a prophecy that is connected to it uh, concerning. Uh, that of Assyria, uh, and then uh, just in chapter 14 and, and 28 through 32, the end of the chapter, uh, we have a break into another uh, prophecy concerning uh, Palestinia or the Philistines, uh, and then chapter 15 and chapter 16 are both dealing with uh, the Moabites and a prophecy or a, a uh, as has already been used a couple of times and is referred to as the burden of Moab and a very heavy burden for their sin and the condition that they are in. Uh, and so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll dive right into these. Let's pray. Lord, I am thankful for every opportunity we have and I'm thankful right now to be able to be here and to be able to study your word. Thankful for each of those that are here and ready to hear your word that may uh, learn from it. I ask that you would remove any distractions or uh, hindrances that there may be that right now we would be intently focused on your word and uh, we would listen to it in the application of it Lord, in our lives that uh, we would grow and we would have a better understanding of you and your will in our lives. I ask you to guide and direct our words, please. Make them in accordance with what you would desire, Lord, in line with your word. Uh, Lord, I'd ask that you would, uh, above all else, I'd ask that everything would be for your honor, glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. So, beginning uh, chapter 14 of Isaiah, starting in verse 24 in Isaiah. Uh, 14 verses 24 through 27, we have a prophecy concerning Assyria. Uh, we look in verse 24, it says, Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand. And we see here that he's telling us that uh, whatever the Lord sets in place, it's what's going to happen. Uh, the, uh, whatever he Whenever the Lord says something, when the Lord says something, when the Lord sets something in motion and says this is going to happen, nothing is going to change that. You can't stop the Lord. You can't change the Lord. And the Lord isn't wrong about things. Uh, it, 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 we, I think of the verse off the top is that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. We think of that in a positive sense, but this is true in a negative sense as well. The promises that God makes in response to sin, He is not slack in keeping those either. Uh, and the rest of, of chapter 14, as I already mentioned, we contain prophecies of Assyria and the Philistines. And you would look at this and you know, it seems to be that there is probably a better place to divide chapter 14 and 15 would be in uh, verse 29. There's a bit of this break here, but... It seems to be very obvious that these verses 24 through 27 are kind of going right after this prophecy concerning Babylon. And the question may arise, you may be thinking, well, why is the Lord connecting this to the prophecy with Babylon? And the reason for this is that the prophecy beforehand for Babylon uh, would not take place for almost 200 years. Uh, give or take. It's, it's going to be a while before that prophecy concerning Babylon actually was fulfilled. And so uh, there wasn't going to be a, a point to really, you weren't going to be able to test it for a while. 
And it, I want you to realize something about this. This is common. This is constant throughout all the scriptures. The Lord has things that he uses to prove that his messengers are really from him. And so when you look at prophecies, and you'll see this with prophets, is that there's oftentimes, a, if there is a long-term prophecy or something that's going to take place far into the future, you will have a short-term prophecy as well that will be given with them that is used to prove that, yes, what they're saying is coming from God because they were right about this. Basically, we have our own, uh, it's a, a tried and true system of, if they're right about this, then they're right about that as well. So the Lord provides the short-term prophecies to prove that the person comes from and to also give the information that's needed so that you know what is coming. And so here we have this prophecy concerning Assyria, which uh, is going to take place uh, shortly and or very quickly compared to the other one. And this is a way of proving that, hey, this is going to come. What I'm telling you about what this is going to happen is actually going to happen. You can believe this. <clears throat> and even here, as the Lord is saying in verse 24, when he's talking about that whatever he says is going to come, what the Lord purposes is going to purpose, it kind of goes into this whole thing of I'm I've got this that I said is going to happen, and you know this is going to happen because I'm telling you this is going to happen, and you're going to witness this. You're going to observe this. And so, everything stays the true with this. I'm the same with everything. Nothing changes. And, and this is something that really, I want you to, there are things concerning the future that we don't really fully understand. There are other things about Scripture that we don't really fully understand about what the Lord does how he does it, and what he's going to do. Uh, especially when it comes to end time events, there, there are some things that we agree, that everyone agrees on, but there are a lot of things that nobody agrees on. And there can be this sense of wondering, well, is this really true? Well, it, and I think it can be you know, after life, after this life, you, is hell, is heaven really true? Are these things really going to take place? Because nobody here has experienced those things. And this is the thing about it. God gives us these other things that he looks at to prove that this is who he is. That this is truth. When we can look, we can look back at history and there are a lot of things that scripture tells us about that we can see, hey, this actually happened. This actually took place. I mean, so God knew this ahead of time. You see, the things concerning Christ and the prophecies that are in the Old Testament and then the prophecies that he fulfills in the Gospels, there's all of these things that you can see that is truth, that are easy to understand, that's very clear to us. And so when it gets to the other things that we haven't really experienced yet, isn't going, hasn't happened yet, or we don't fully understand every detail about it, you can have faith and know that it's true, that it's going to happen, because God was the same today as He is yesterday and all of these other things. And he was right about that, and He's done this, and He's done that. And so that can be, a, in a way, a proof to us that what's coming is true as well. The same thing is true for us as it was for in this, and we just have a lot more of what has come before as proof as what's going to come in the future. Uh, and, you know, this really applies in a lot of ways in your uh, reliance on the Lord. You'll know that He's done this in the past or He's done this for other people and so you know He can do it for you too or He's going to do it and continue to do it. So as we continue in verse 25, He says, and that I will break the Assyrian with my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. And then shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off of their shoulders. The Lord here uh, predicts that uh, he will break the Assyrians when they come into their land. And uh, we already, in chapters 8 and through 12, had already talked about this a lot, about what was going to take place with Assyria as well, that this... Uh, a prophecy concerning their fall. And the Lord is again here referencing and as proof 
to what's going to happen. Uh, and this is because the Lord purposes it. Verse 26 and 27 it says, This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, who shall disannul it? His hand is stretched out, who shall turn it back? And he says, and this is why it's going to take place. Because this is the purpose of what's going to happen. This is the plan that has been set in place. And it's been set in place by the Lord. And the Lord is the one that controls the whole earth. The Lord is the one that sets in motion and decides what is going to happen in the whole earth. Nothing happens without the Lord's permission, without the Lord's hand. It's part of everything. He says, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations. The Lord has his hand upon all nations. Nations that rise, nations that fall. It's all the Lord's hand and part of it as well. There's reasons for it. There's ways it works. It all happens because that's what the Lord wants. And when the Lord purposes it, when the Lord sets it in place, nobody else can miss it all. Nobody else can uproot it. Nobody else can end it. And this, this applies to everything. And the greatest of that being salvation. You know, our, our salvation... Our forgiveness of sins, our promise of eternity has been purposed and secured by the Lord. It's not secured by us. And that's a good thing because if it's secured by us, we, were all, we would all be wasting our time in trying to secure it because we wouldn't be able to secure it. We wouldn't be able to keep it. We can't earn it. We can't do anything to make it possible. The Lord is the one that purposes it. Satan cannot take it. Nobody else can take it. You can't get rid of it. Because God has purposed it and set it in place. The same is true with his judgments as well. When the Lord sets in place his judgments, it is too late. The day will come when every but all those that have rejected the Lord will have to pay for their rejection of the Lord's wrath. Eternity in the lake of fire. When people have missed the opportunity, when the Lord's hand is put in place to begin putting that, it's too late. The Lord sets something in place, nobody can stop it or veto it. So he says this about the Assyrians, and now in verse 28 we get into uh, the Palestinian or the Philistines. Uh, it says in verse 28, in the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. I have another burden here in the verse uh, 29. It says, Rejoice not thou, O Palestinian, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth the cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. The Lord says to the Philistines, and he says, rejoice not. And the, what he, they're rejoicing in, as he said, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. And it, a, a little bit of a, a backstory here that is needed uh, is that two kings previous to Ahaz was Uzziah, and then you had Jotham, jo jo and then you had Ahaz, and then now Hezekiah at this point. And when Uzziah was in power, he actually had a lot of victories over the Philistines. He, was, he conquered them and, and secured them very well and, and kind of uh, put them under. But then after, uh, he, uh, uh, after he was removed from the throne, uh, we had again that once he was then with, with Ahaz uh, and jo Jotham to some extent as well, uh, the Philistines started gaining their ground back against them. They started being able to push back. They were able to have some success against the Israelites. And when Ahaz died, Hezekiah was the, throne, was the one that took the throne. And when he took the throne, he was only 25 years old. And so the, the theory is that since he was a young king and they'd already had success in these other kings, that the success would continue. It would probably even get easier if they would uh, be uh, 
secure in these things. It would be easy victories. But the Lord tells them, he says, actually, the opposite is going to be true. And something I, I want you to realize about this, Hezekiah was a good king. Ahaz was a bad king. And that was a direct correlation to the strength of Israel, as is with the entirety of Israel's history. Good kings, success, bad kings, no success. Good king, all right, then the beginning, success, bad king in the end, no success. And this is something the Lord told them from the very beginning. He said, if you follow me, I'll bless you. If you reject me and you go after other gods, I'm going to punish you. I'll be with you if you're following me, but I'm not going to if you don't follow me. And that's exactly what took place with every single king. With Israel as a whole. And so within this, when he's talking, he says, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. This would be in reference to uh, Uzziah. And then he says, in uh, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. The serpent's uh, root uh, could be referring to either Ahaz or maybe even Uzziah, but we're, we're talking about the, the lineage here. And then the cockatrice, and a cockatrice is actually a, a viper. We're still talking about the serpents, vipers, and things. This being Hezekiah, he says that this out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. He's going to have a lot of success against you. And notice here as we continue into verse 30, he talks about Hezekiah. He says, and the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he will slay thy remnant. So the Lord, he talks about this uh, firstborn of the poor, the poor being Israel and the, the oppression that the Philistines had had and their success against, uh, or not really Israel, but Judah. And uh, the firstborn of the poor being the leader of the king, Hezekiah. And he says that under him, the poor shall feed, they will be fed, and they will be protected, because then the needy shall lie down in safety. Then Judah, they're, they're going to be protected, they're going to prosper, they're going to be given these things under the leadership of Hezekiah. But he says, for you, the Philistines, he says, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. And he says, and what's going to happen for you is I'm going to send a famine upon you. And a lot of you are going to die. You're going to be weakened because of that. And then whatever of you that survive this, Hezekiah is going to come in and he's going to kill you. He's going to destroy the remnant. So I'm going to weaken you with a famine. And Hezekiah is going to come in and clean up. So the opposite is actually going to happen. You think it's going to get easy? You think you can rejoice in this and that's not exalt? at all what's going to happen. As he continues in verse 31, he says, How, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestinian, art dissolved, for thou, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. And he even tells them, he says, cry, moan, mourn, because this is what's going to happen. You're going to be destroyed. And he talks about this north smoke. And this is in reference to the army of Judah that's going to come underneath Hezekiah. Uh, <clears throat> and they were to the north of the Philistines. Uh, so he tells them they're going to come in. And you know they're just going to wipe out everybody. Not going to have a chance. And then in 32, and he says, And what shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord had found in Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it? And he says, And through this, the result is that people are going to realize that God is in control, and that they have been established, that Judah has been established again because of the power of the Lord. They again have their strength. 
Now we continue into 15. And it starts off in verse 1. It says, In the burden of Moab, because in the night uh, Ar of Moab was laid waste and brought to silence, because in the night Ker of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. We have here uh, the prophecy concerning the burden, as is mentioned, uh, for Moab. And that there's going to be a, a great mourning because of it. And the Moabites were actually descendants of Lot. And, you know, this is interesting. Just recently we talked about... Um, <clears throat> they just went from me. Esau's descendants. Edom, yes. We just talked about the Edomites recently and that they were, uh, one of the problems the Lord had with them was that they were related to Israel and they should have been helping them and instead they were plundering them and, and punishing them. And you know, the Moabites uh, coming uh, from Lot were related as well. And people, and instead of being allies as they should have been, they are instead enemies. And they've caused these problems. They've, they've come across them uh, so many times. And so the Lord here has a prophecy concerning their destruction. And in verses 1, and then we are in 1 and now in 2, he says, And he has gone up to Bajib and to Dinon, the high places, to weep Moab, shall howl over Nebo, and over Mediba, on all their heads shall be baldness and every beard cut off. He mentions here cities within Moab and talks about the, 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 the destruction, the laying waste coming in. To each of them. And as a result of this great destruction, we see at the end of 2, it talks about the baldness, uh, all their heads be baldness and every board, beard cut off. And then in verse 3, it continues and says, And in their streets they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on the tops of their houses, and in their streets every one shall howl, weeping abundantly. And he says, And because of what's going to come through and run throughout uh, Moab, there's going to be a great mourning that's going to happen. He talks about them, the, the shaving of their heads and the, the cutting off of their beards, which was a symbol of mourning. And then as well, it talks about them uh, in the streets, they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on top of the houses. They're, they're going to be wearing the sackcloth, the, the, the mourning clothing, as you could say. It'll be a great mourning. And then in verse 4, notice this, he, and he says it then, he says, a weeping abundantly in verse 4, he says, And Heshbon shall cry, and Eliah, their voice shall be heard even unto Jahaz. Therefore the armed soldiers of Moab shall cry out, his life shall be grievous unto him. Notice here he describes the armed soldiers as mourning and being grievous and upset. Now, who are the, the, the armed soldiers normally? In the nation, the strongest, the bravest, the best. And here he describes that the destruction is going to be so great that the strongest, the bravest, the best are going to be broken in mourning and crying because of the destruction. It would be a complete loss of morale because of how bad it's going to be. Remember verse 5, it says, My heart shall cry out for Moab. Uh, his fugitives shall free unto, flee unto Zoar, a heifer of the, four of three years old by the mounting up of Luath with weeping shall they go up for in the way of Hornanum they shall rise up a cry of destruction. And he says that they're, they're going to be crying out with their weeping and that as a result they're going to flee and run. And he describes here a heifer of three years old, which is basically this would be a full grown cow. And a, uh, if you're really what is being described here is that the, the, the full grown cow has a, a much higher, louder cry, and uh, that is actually true. They're the ones that are easiest to hear. And so he 
Uh, he says that this cry is going to be a very extreme cry, very loud cry that is taking place. It's heard throughout as they flee, as they weep. And he says in verse 6, he says, For the waters of Nero shall be desolate, for the hay is withered away, the grass faileth, and there is no green thing. This is the condition of the famine that is going to be upon them. And he says that there's not going to be any waters. The waters are going to be dried up. And you're, you're not going to have any hay to feed your animals. You're not going to have any grass to grow either. There's not going to be anything. This is a very dry, a very intense famine that's going to take place here. And that the entirety of Moab will be mourning because of this. Because in verse 7 it says, Therefore, the abundance they have gotten at which they have laid up, shall they carry away to the brook of the willows. And if it says that the entirety of, of Moab will be a mourning because of this a desolate they'll be, they'll be fleeing away and in verse 8 it says for the cry is gone round about the borders of Moab the howling therefore of in, in, unto Eglim the howling thereof unto Berlim for the waters of demons shall be full of blood for I will bring more upon demon lines upon him that escapeth of Moab and upon the remnant of the land the, the, the death is going to be so great that it's going to be as if it is running with blood. And of those that survive, he says, I'm going to bring lions up upon them to kill whatever survives. Whether this be the form of a, uh, an army or whether it's actual lions that he does. But he, he says, there's going to be great death. And you're going to think that, man, I'm lucky to have survived this. And then I'm going to come in and take the rest. Complete and total destruction. Now in verse six, chapter 16, we get to a bit of a plea for repentance. Whether this is uh, <clears throat> Isaiah writing, asking of them to consider this, or it was a, uh, a attempted repentance on the behalf of the Moabites. We see here in verse 1, it says, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Salah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. <clears throat> During the reign of David, the Moabites were conquered and forced to pay tribute unto Israel. And this actually continued all the way up until the reign of Ahab. They continued paying unto Judah, uh, basically tribute for being slaves to them. But under, under the leadership of Ahab, they rebel. And here we have this, basically what they're saying is, uh, attempt to start sending this tribute to them again. Let's see if we can fix this problem that is here, or you know, send this as a, a tribute to the Lord, uh, is a, a response to this. And he says in verse 2, and he says, For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be as the fords of Arnon. And this is a response because of the prophecy that basically they're going to be scattered. They're going to be pushed all throughout. When it talks about here of the, the wandering bird cast out of the nest, and they're just going to be spread, kicked out. And it's already talked about their fleeing. As well here, look in verse 3, it says, Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of noonday, hide the outcast, beware, be rare, be ray, not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab, be thou a, co co a covert unto to them. From the face of the spoiler, for the executioner is at an end. The spoiler seeth us. Ceaseth, I can't talk tonight. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Herod describes for us that they are called, uh, so take the counsel, execute judgment, uh, do what's right. 
You know, we've seen this as a, a common thing in uh, Judah, Israel, others, other sinful nations as well. It's one of the things that is described of them as that there's no righteous judgments. That the, the judges basically kind of do whatever they want to. There, there's nothing that lines up with what is actually true. You don't have any good judges. You know, the people, they reject what is right and run towards what is bad. So he says, take counsel, execute correct judgments. Make thy shadow uh, is in the midst of the noonday so you can hide the outcasts. Protect the people that need protecting. Take care of them, accept in those that need it. And he describes here specifically, he says, let mine outcasts dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a calm covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the executioner is at end, the spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed. I land specifically here. He's saying specifically, you need to be offering help to my people, to Israel, when they have the attacks that come. The Assyrians were going to come upon them and attack them, and he's telling the Moabites, help them with this. Be a place of, of safekeeping for them instead of an enemy. merciful because in verse 5 it says and in mercy shall the throne be established and you shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David judging and seeking judgment and hastening righteousness and this may all be so that maybe they can receive mercy and as I mentioned in this week it's not really clear for sure whether or not this is a Moabites trying to make it half-hearted appeal at uh, repentance or whether it's a call for them to do this, but regardless of it, their pride is too great for it, for it to matter, for anything to change. Because look at this in verse 6, he says, We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Says, but we know, really, the Moabites, your pride is too great. Your arrogance, your haughtiness is so high that you're not going to do what's right. You're not going to make the changes that are needed. You're not going to make yourself right. So nothing's going to change. They're full of their pride. They're full of their wrath and lies. So, in verse six, verse seven. It says, "Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab; every one shall howl for the foundations of Kirase. Shall ye mourn? Surely they are stricken." It says they're going. Everything's going to be bad. They're still going to be pain. They're still going to have this morning. Verse 8 says, For the fields of Heshbon languish in the vine of Sima. The lords of the heathen have broken down the principal plants that are up there. Come even to Jezer. They wander through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out. They are gone over the sea. They're stretched out with us, these the things that are taking place, broken down. But I want us to really kind of notice here, in verse 9, it says, Therefore, I will be well with the weeping of Yazer, the vine of Simeon. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Elah. For the shouting for thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen. Notice here though that Isaiah, he's expressing here the dismay and the, the destruction that's going to take place here. And he basically says, and I'm going to feel, I'm going to mourn for you as well. I am going to be sorrowful for this. 
Because this isn't a great thing that's taking place in here. This isn't something that I should be rejoicing because uh, as thy summer fruits and for uh, shouting for thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen. They don't have a harvest. They don't have any summer fruits. They haven't produced anything. This destruction is taking place here. He even says in verse 2, he says, And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field and the vineyards. There shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their, pro their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. This is, a, this is not a good thing. This is a sad thing. And you know, I think this is an important point to make. We are not to rejoice in the destruction of those that reject the Lord. We're not to rejoice in our enemies' fall. We just talked in chapter 14 about the Philistines rejoicing because they thought that they were in destruction. We've looked at others as Israel was called out for uh, coming up against Judah and uh, others have been, the uh, Hemites were called out for rejoicing when Israel was, just, was taken and participating in it. And we see that each time the Lord's like, you don't, you don't do this. Don't do this. This isn't a rejoicing matter. This isn't something that's good. And this is our, our sin nature. We desire to rejoice when our enemies are destroyed. It's what we want. But yet we should be mourning, we should be sad that they have rejected the Lord and are dealing with His wrath. We should be sad and burdensome when people die without the Lord. You know, it's something that happens, we, we like to rejoice in the bad things. Bad people going away. But that's not the way that it is. The Lord doesn't rejoice in being able to punish people, being able to deal with that too. He does it out of necessity. I want you to notice this in verse 11. He says, Wherefore my bowels shall sound like an ark for Moab, and mine inward parts for Kiresh. The burdensome, that he, the burden that he feels goes all the way to his bowels, all the way to his inward flesh. This is not a superficial sorrow that he's experiencing. This is not a, oh, I have to do this. This is a real, true, heartfelt sadness. says, and it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. And this is Moab's going to they're going to attempt to seek their gods, they're going to seek to gain help for all of this, but it's going to fail. It's going to come against them. It'll be too late even if they decide to try and seek the Lord. And in verse 13 it says, And this is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord hath spoken, saying, Within three years of the years of a hireling and the glory of Moab shall be content. With all that great multitude and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. And he says, And this is all going to take place. Three years. And all that will be left is a very small and feeble remnant. 
complete total destruction. These nations provide an example of what it is to win when we, what happens when a nation rejects the Lord, when a people turn away, when a people ignore Him, when people go and sin. The Lord doesn't let it go on forever. He takes action on it. He takes it very seriously. But even when we're following the Lord and we see His destruction come on the enemy because of their sins, we still should not be rejoicing. We should be burdensome. We should be wishing that they would have accepted the Lord, that they would have followed Him. The heart of every believer should be that, that everyone would be saved. The same as the Lord. The Lord's heart is that all of them be saved. Christ died on the cross so that those that put him there could be saved if they so choose. Paul, persecuted time and time again by the Jews, said, I am willing to give up my own salvation for them to have it if it would make a difference. The people that persecuted him time and time again that hated his guts. There are ones that ultimately arrested him, what ultimately led to his death. 